It's my pleasure to, uh, to next uh, introduce uh, uh, Christy Miller from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, I just need to put, use, put, put, make a little reference here to, uh, to how this whole project uh, actually started. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting. So last year at this same event, the last session of the day was um, a session that Christy actually spoke at and one of our other panelists is going to be participating today, Brian uh, Riddle, was also part of that. And at the end of it, we just had this offline discussion when, with the close of the meeting and said, you know, why don't we take this to the next level? Why don't we, why don't we actually look at an opportunity um, where, you know, again, Christie's representing the end user and we actually take this technology and actually um, develop it a bit further so it's actually of direct use to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and for that matter, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and so on. So that's how this whole thing began. And um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Christy Miller today, who's going to tell us about that project and about kind of the evolution of our thoughts, and uh, that'll continue on with the panel. So, Christy, thank you. that we were undertaking with Genome BC that has just finished um, this year. And now I have the um, pleasurable opportunity to speak about a new program that we've been co-developing with Genome BC for uh, really the past year. Um, so this project is um, being um, co-led by myself and, and Brian Riddle at the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and Brian's here in the audience um, and will be part of the uh, panel discussions. Um, so the, the, the project that we, we just have, uh, have finished was what I talked about last time, and I won't spend a lot of time on that project. This, this project was called the um, um, Egypt Fish Menomics Project, and it was really instigated um, to try to resolve what, what are some of the issues um, facing salmon productivity declines, and using um, functional genomic approaches um, to determine what factors may be undermining salmon performance. Uh, and, and, during this four, it was a four-year program. During this four-year program, we, we carried out uh, thousands of, of, of arrays. Um, we, we ran thousands of arrays in numerous um, different studies. And, and one of the things that we observed um, was a preponderance of, of powerful signatures associated with strong immune differential immune stimulation. And within this program, we also identified um, from, um, from some of these fish um, uh, a novel virus um, that hadn't been previously characterized in, in salmon. I talked about that a little bit last year. Um, and, and, and from these, these studies, we have many hypotheses for factors that may be undermining performance. But one of the hypotheses that we began to, to develop was, was that infectious, infectious disease may be a factor. Um, and, and was an unexplored, um, largely unexplored factor in these declines. And I'm just showing um, um, basically a couple, a heat map of, of one of our microarray studies. This was a, a gill study um, where we were looking at um, at the differences in in the, the gill re, um, um, genome in in different years, in years of high and low productivity. 2007, these were out migrating smolts. Um, in 2007, 2008, 2009, and 2010, and 2007 was were the smolts that never came back in 2009, and were the subject of of the uh, Cohen inquiry um, um, that started uh, um, in 2009. And and one of the things that we observed in this in, in, in this particular study, and we see all this in other tissues as well, was that 2007 um, um, transcriptome of, of the gill was an outlier from all other years. And you can see that. Uh, this, this signature here, and interestingly, um, despite the, the, the really common scientific hypothesis that a lot of what's going on in, in terms of determining productivity is in the ocean, what we observed using genomics was that, that the outlier signature was actually in freshwater, not in the marine environment. So those, those fish actually left salt water very, very, in a very, very different state um, than they had left salt water, or uh, left freshwater in, in, in other years. And, and, and part of this signature, again, showed this really interesting uh, differential immune stimulation in, 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 in the types of cells that, that are 
involved in, in, in immune responses in, in gill tissue. An, another one which we, we published a study in Science uh, in 2011 and identified a signature associated with premature mortality of return migrating adults. We discovered, and I talked about this last time, this same signature in out-migrating smolts. Um, and we discovered that this signature decreases um, over migration in the first six months in the ocean, uh, potentially um, associated with, with a shift in, in, in survival. Um, and this is the same signature that we ultimately identified a, a novel virus out of. Um, but we haven't established whether that virus is causative of that signature yet. So, the Cohen Commission of Inquiry, um, I talked briefly about that. They, that wrapped up the evidentiary hearings, wrapped up um, right before I gave it to the talk here last year. Um, and, and one of the hypotheses that, that was being explored within these hearings was the potential for, for disease to impact um, um, salmon productivity. And um, it, it is sort of, the combination of the Fish Minomics Project and, and some of the discussions and, and hearings um, that went on at the Cohen Commission that really instigated the formation of this new project. And, and one of the, the, the really out, outstanding observations that I had and many others had was that there really was a clear lack of sufficient information on even the pathogens that may be impacting wild salmon in the ocean. There just hadn't been a lot of study on that particular phase of the life history of wild salmon. We knew a fair bit about hatchery fish um, in fresh water. We knew a fair bit about, about Atlantic salmon in, in, in net pens, but very little about wild fish. Uh, there was also um, came, what came out of this inquiry was, was a recognition that, that while salmon farm mortalities are lower than they have been um, in the past, um, if, if you compare today versus 10 years ago, um, oh, that again, this lack of understanding, over 60% of the daily mortalities that are occurring on farms are open farm cases, which means that they're the suspected um, etiological agents that cause disease are actually unknown. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of, of, of um, speculation as to what, what might be causing these mortalities, um, even, even if the mortalities are lower than they have been historically. Uh, there's, if, if you followed any of the media or, or, or news stories, there was an overwhelming public support for building a greater understanding of the role of disease in wild fish, again an instigating factor in the development of this new program. Um, and, and there was a notable um, muted, more muted support from managers and regulators, um, and, and really this muted support came from the difficulty in communicating the message about this. The, you know, this is a, a really polarized issue um, involving aquaculture industry, involving um, you know, salmon management, and, 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 they, and they were concerned about how do you rate, um, communicate information about disease to the public. And, and there's also the potential um, that, that, you know, if, if new diseases are discovered, um, that they may affect trade um, um, and, and have other implications. So, as Brad suggested, um, you know, we, we began discussions between Genome BC, Pacific Salmon Foundation, and, and myself and Fisheries and Oceans, and, and we really began going out to managers and policymakers and people in industry and, and sort of dealing with the question of how genomic technologies could bring clarity to the issues surrounding infectious disease um, and, and the potential for novel viruses, um, wild salmon productivity, and, and, the, and the, the sort of uh, more interesting one in a, in a public debate is the potential interactions between uh, cultured and wild fish. And we, when I say cultured and wild fish, you, you, can't, you, you can't leave that at aquaculture and wild fish because we also have hatchery fish and those are cultured at least in the freshwater environment. So those potential interactions are something that we're interested in as well. And I just show down here at the bottom of the slide uh, a few of the kinds of technologies that, that we're bringing to the table um, to answer some of these questions. Um, one of which is a, the, the fluidine, and I had a slide on this at the very end of my talk last year. We were just beginning to look at the potential for this technology um, to, to bring some resolution to these issues. Uh, massively parallel sequencing, this is something that we're getting into a, a little bit more now, and obviously microarrays, which is something we've been doing for a while. Um, so the, the strategic goal that this the projects, uh, the, the strategic uh, BC Salmon Health Initiative, um, the goal is really to discover um, the pathogens and potential diseases that may undermine productivity and performance of BC salmon, um, and to determine what exchanges might happen between cultured and, and wild salmon being aquaculture, um, um, hatchery culture, and, and wild salmon in the transmission and evolution of these pathogens. Um, and we, we're, we're taking a highly multidisciplinary approach to this. 
Uh, we have um, experts in genomics, um, not including others besides myself, um, epidemiology, histopathology, immunology, virology, parasitology, salmon ecology, and bioinformatics. And really, to, to be able to get from what microbes are out there to what diseases might be important, you need this multidisciplinary um, um, team of experts. Um, one of the things that, that we, we tried to, 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 to do to drive this program was, was drive it from the stakeholders. Um, and, and this is what our early discussions with managers and policymakers, it became very clear that communication was a, was a big issue within any kind of program like this. And so we decided to develop a stakeholder panel really early in the game for this program. Um, and so that we could, we could really uh, look at their views and look at, look at their needs and their issues with the communication of, of, of any potential science that came out of this. And this is just a listing, and I'm not going to uh, name them all, of the different groups who, have, um, who will be working on this, on this stakeholder panel, which has not yet met. Um, and this is uh, just, we, we've, we decided to do this project in four phases. Um, and um, the first phase uh, began this year, and we're just culminating um, the first phase, which was really just about collecting um, sufficient samples to be able to carry out some of the microbe surveillance. We already had a backbone of, of samples that we collected in our last program, so this, this sort of brought us to five years of samples about migrating smolts. We have over 15,000 um, samples um, of smolts um, collected um, throughout um, southern BC. And, um, and, and this, we, we sort of, we, we increased our efforts in this in, in 2012. Uh, this is an important year to increase our efforts there because this was the big out migration year for sockeye salmon, which was one of the species that we're most keenly interested in, but we're also working in, in Chinook salmon as well, another species that is undergoing really dramatic declines in, in productivity. Um, so the second phase, which I can talk about a little bit more here, and this is one that, that's under the final phases of development right now, which is, which is when and where are potential pathogens present. And, and you notice that we're talking about microbes here, not necessarily disease, and I have a slide that I'll, I'll tell you why this is. Um, but in this particular phase, we're developing screening technologies, we're, we're actually screening samples, we, we have a, a desire to identify novel viruses if they exist, uh, to explore the potential for microbe associations with disease, and to explore transmission and evolution of potential pathogens. Um, and then it is really in the third phase where we get to disease. So this is, this is sort of bucks the trend of traditional fish health research and, fit, and traditional health research in general, which usually starts with disease and then goes back and uses diagnostics to look at, at what pathogens or, or microbes may, may instigate that disease. Um, but in this case, phase three is about disease, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then phase four is really the translational part. H how do we use these tools and information to benefit fisheries? And, 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 and we need to develop the strategies for the application, both of the technologies that we're developing, but also the information. So the phase two, I, I, I'm going to go over just quickly what, uh, why we're starting with microbes and not disease. Um, we, we recognize that there is this declining early marine survival um, and that disease is one hypothesized factor. Um, but the problem is that we rarely observe fish die, um, especially in the ocean. They just simply drop out, uh, predators take them, uh, you know, so we don't really get the opportunity to sample diseased fish uh, you know, at, the, at the time of their final um, um, end of life. So, we, because of this, we really have limited knowledge on the microbes that affect uh, wild and hatchery salmon in the ocean, um, and in some cases, even what microbe, microbe might be responsible for mortality of farm salmon, and I already said 60% of fish that die on a, on an, a daily basis on farms, we don't know what, what microbes might be involved. Um, many microbes um, um, have never even been assessed in, in wild populations. Many of the microbes associated with emerging diseases in Europe have never been assessed whether they were actually present here. Um, and, um, and, and so we're focusing this program on, on microbes that are suspected or known to associate with disease and mortality in salmon throughout the world. So we're not limiting to only the, the microbes that we know to exist in BC. And this will be the largest scale surveillance of salmon microbes that's ever been conducted. Um, we're focusing on, on doing surveillance of about 45 microbes. Um, and what's, what's like, again, really, really important in any kind of program like this that has the amount of public scrutiny and, and, and interest by policymakers is that we have very clear lines of communication. Um, and we recognize that in, in phase two, 
um, that the mere presence of microbes is not an indication of disease. And that, that, that's, that's probably going to be one of the most contentious issues of this, is, is that we're not starting with disease, and we have to be very careful about how we message that. Um, so in phase two, the, the, the first objective is, is a platform in assay development um, and the validation for high throughput mic microbe surveillance, and we're using the Fluidine Biomark um, as this platform, and we've already begun um, some of this development. Um, and we have been working, um, uh, trying to work with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency because some of the microbes that we will be working on are reportable microbes and they do affect trade, um, and we do want to include them in our work, um, and there's about seven of them on our list. Um, but in order to be working with these microbes, you really have to go to a higher level of validation than one would usually go to for basic scientific research. And so we've agreed to, to go through that higher level of, of, of validation of the microbes on the Fluidine platform, which, which takes a little bit more time, um, but in the end will really help us um, um, get this, this technology into um, the diagnostic labs that, that have um, you know, important policy um, roles. So the microbe surveillance study, I really see this as a discovery stage for this program. We're, we're trying to discover what microbes um, wild fish, hatchery fish, and, and, and aquaculture fish carry in British Columbia. Um, we're targeting 45 microbes, uh, 10,000 fish, and we're looking again at all salmon in BC. Um, and so this, this is, this is, this is going to be a very large effort um, at, at trying to get really a snapshot, a snapshot over five or six years of collections of what microbes um, um, our salmon might be exposed to. So the microgenome sequencing, we'll, we'll be following that, and, 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 and the goal of, of this portion is, is really to gain full genome sequences of any novel viruses that we may uncover, and novel viruses are going to be defined as those that we did not know to exist in BC, so they can be viruses that, that, that are associated with diseases elsewhere in salmon, but have never been um, found to exist in BC, or they could be just completely new viruses that we uncover um, um, in, in salmon in BC. Um, and, and we're trying to get long sequence reads for other microbes. Um, there's this, we're also attempting to use um, full genome sequences of viruses for our epidemiology research. Um, and and there's, there's a lot that could have been gained if this kind of approach could have been used with ISA virus in Europe um, from the beginning um, to, to better identify um, um, you know, the, the, the dip, what segments are, are involved in virulence, et cetera. Um, and, and we're also going to be using transcriptome um, data um, at the same time we're doing the, the microbe sur uh, surveillance for um, RNA viruses. So I just thought the, the dendrogram there on the bottom is just a uh, dendrogram of the, of the novel salmon virus that we discovered um, a year ago. Um, it's a parvovirus. Um, just a little picture. Um, so the fourth element is the epidemiology, and, and this is really um, focusing on the transmission between aquaculture and wild fish, hatchery and hatchery and wild fish, and, and, and asking the question, how long might microbes have been in BC? We have two really uh, renowned epidemiologists from University of uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, Larry Hamill and Ian Gardner, who will be working on this part of the project. Um, histopathology, this is, this is a, a really key element in this program because this is what's going to get us from what microbes are existing to whether those microbes may be associated with, with tissue damage. Um, and we've, we've managed to attract uh, an excellent uh, histopathologist, um, um, Hugh Ferguson, who basically wrote the book on fish histopathology. Um, and he's, he's tasked with identifying what microbes are associated with pathological changes in tissue, um, and, and the industry, we're, we're getting samples from industry through the DFO audit program. This program is a, a program that, that basically collects about 600 um, um, fish dying on farms per year, random, a random sample of, of fish dying on farms, and, and, and routinely performs histopathology. We will be doing the microbe surveillance on these same fish, um, and, and Hugh will be trying to link um, the, the microbe data that we attain with the, histo with the histopathology data um, and identify which, one, which microbes may be associated with some of the, with some of the, the lesions that he identifies. And then, um, importantly, identifying fish where we don't have any, you know, even with four, 45 microbes, we don't have any, any microbes associated with them. Those would be ones um, that we will um, put in for, um, for in-depth sequencing. 
So um, finally, we're looking at, at, at retrospective genomic analysis of the host transcriptome. This is using the backbone of the microarray data that we already have um, from the Fish Genomics Project. We've got over 3,000 mi uh, microarrays run in this program. So we will be, um, we'll be including in our surveillance the same fish that we've used in that, in that program. So we can begin to identify host response signatures and, and the strength of the path and the pathways uh, stimulated, providing again another clue to the pathogenic potential of microbes. Um, we, we also have a goal of, of, of doing some research in the area of microbe ecology and looking at, at microbe associations with variances in productivity of different salmon stocks. Um, and ultimately, the, the last goal of phase two is to rank microbes by the potential to cause disease in, in wild salmon. And this will be involving our team of experts, but also will go out even broader to more experts in the field. Oops, I missed one. Yeah. Um, and our third phase is focuses uh, to shifts to disease. And in this phase, it's not as, as well developed by our team yet, but um, involves controlled laboratory challenge studies, um, experimental transmission studies stress challenges and more, and, and this, this full team hasn't um, yet been developed, um, but, but will be. Uh, and phase four um, was really extensive consultation um, and collaboration, building collaboration with labs that are interested in bringing the technology that we develop here um, um, to use and um, developing the next stages of implement implementation with fisheries managers. And this is, I just have the icons for the, um, many different organizations that we could be interacting with at that point in time. So the benefits of the program um, is the inexpensive high throughput microbe surveillance platform that could be used um, in the future by other labs, including diagnostic labs. Um, we fill in the gaps associated with open farm cases. Uh, the industry could use this to prioritize future mitigation and monitoring, um, and researchers and managers and policymakers can use them to assess impacts on wild fish. We can validate how healthy farm fish are compared to wild fish, determine transmission dynamics, um, assess potential negative impacts on wild fish. Ongoing surveillance um, of, of wild fish could actually be used to, to mitigate potential disease outbreaks on farms. Uh, we have the hatchery potential for hatchery mitigation of disease. Um, and an increase in public confidence in the management of, of, of salmon in BC. And this is something that's very important for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to show. Um, so I just, this is my last, my last slide, is, is really, um, how, how, so how does this program realize the full salmon genome sequence? How does that fit into this project? There's two places where the availability of that full um, genome sequence is really important to us. One is the identification of novel microbes, and we're working with the Joe Dorisi lab in California on this. And, and, and the pipeline that they've developed to identify highly novel viruses uh, requires the, the, subtractive, the, the subtraction of the host genome. And so it'll be very important to have the backdrop of the host genome to be able to do this work. And the second is the um, use of RNA-seq um, transcriptome analysis. Uh, this is a lot more efficient in, um, if, you have, um, if, you, if you can reconstruct the full length transcripts. Um, it's very, very difficult to do without a reference genome. So that's it.